Hi, my name is Sönke Treinis and I'm Product Manager at HPK. And today I have the pleasure to meet Evelyn from the Academy and we will talk about cycle detection. Hi Evelyn, it's a pleasure to see you today. We have a HPK Power Analyzer here with us. What makes it so special? Hi Sönke, when you um, regard this electrical drive train uh, and when you regard the signals at the inverter output, uh, then you can see that you mostly have no sinusoidal signals. And uh, th this makes it difficult to, or impossible to use the formula um, for power calculation like we know it from the mains net. I like to explain this with two formulas. So the problem is we don't have a cosine phi with which we can calculate um, the active power because the signals are not sinusoidal. But we measure anyhow a voltage at every time uh, and the current at every time and from both we can calculate the instantaneous power. Yeah, So this is just a multiplication between the voltage over time and the current over the time. And as a result this is our um, instantaneous power and this instantaneous power rotates around its mean value. And this mean value, this is our active power too. So the active power uh, can be calculated as a mean value um, over a time period, which we call a cycle, and um, from the instantaneous power over the time. Thank you very much, Evelyn. For the cycle T, does it have to be constant? Uh, it might be constant. When you regard a vehicle with a constant speed and you want to measure the drive cycle and you want to calculate all the efficiencies and all the power, that's a good solution to have a fixed time T where everything is calculated. So. Evelyn, if I got you right, it becomes really interesting once the cycle isn't constant all the time, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, so that's why our colleague Mitch made a test here with his uh, little e-scooter. He equipped it fully with uh, our power analyzer and uh, he measured the three phases current and three phases voltage uh, on the inverter output and uh, calculated the efficiencies and uh, the powers from these measured signals. But um, he first started uh, the scooter and uh, then he went a bit uphill, he went downhill, he did some brakes, he did some jumps and he accelerated again. And um, yeah, so it is a great possibility uh, to adapt now, uh, now our calculation cycle uh, to the real drive cycle of Mitch. So, Evelyn, as I know you, I'm pretty sure that you got some measurements from Mitch for us today, right? Yes, that's right. Um, so, what you can see here, this is his little trip with the e-scooter. And uh, we have here in the first pane the three uh, currents, which are uh, nearly sinusoidal and we have a so-called cycle master which I will explain in the next step. Uh, here in the middle you see the three phases uh, voltages and you see that these are not sinusoidal and uh, down here we can see the apparent power, the reactive power and also the active power. You just spoke about the cycle master that you saw. Could you give it some more detail? 
Um, yeah, the cycle master is this uh, square wave signal and it has exactly the same frequency than um, one of the currents, uh, which we call the cycle source. And uh, this is what I want to explain you now. So um, to um, adapt our um, calculation cycle to the real drive cycle, um, we look for the zero crossings uh, within a sinusoidal signal. And this can be, uh, for example, the first current on the inverter, which is then our cycle source. And when we regard here the ze positive zero crossings, um, between two positive zero crossings, there's always one cycle, one full cycle, which equals the period um, of our current and um, yeah uh, the time period of our current um, is smaller when we uh, drive slower when we drive faster the time period is much shorter yeah because um, the um, frequency of the electrical signal yeah uh, is uh, related to the frequency um, that we uh, measure mechanical um, via the number of pole pairs. And how robust is this method? Um, we can optimize the cycle detection with some different methods uh, so that we can clearly detect uh, the cycle within the cycle source even when there's noise. So if our signal has an offset uh, this is not a problem. We can define another level. This must not be a zero crossing uh, that we are looking for. It can be also a different level, uh, depending on the offset. Um, if there's noise, um, let me paint something here. So I will paint some noise into the signal. Um, let's do it like that. Um, yeah, there might be a cycle detection or, or a zero crossing detection already here um, in the positive uh, direction. Yeah, and uh, so this might be a shorter cycle here uh, than it is normally uh, only due to noise. Yeah, um, to protect us um, from the wrong cycle detection, we can uh, define a hysteresis, and this hysteresis is a span. Yeah, it's a it's a span to the defined level, and uh, the signal must cross first here this uh, um, hysteresis. Yeah, and then the level in the same direction, so that the cycle is clearly detected. So in this case, the signal did not left the hysteresis. Yeah, so it did not come from outside into the hysteresis again. Yeah, and that's why here is no um, level crossing detected. Ideally, the hysteresis uh, must be bigger than the noise, but um, smaller than the signal, the cycle source signal itself, uh, so that um, the cycle detection works properly. Okay, so great. So I know how this works with the hysteresis, but what do I do if I have a, a really big spike on my signal that which just would slam my hysteresis? Uh, yeah, so if you have a peak, uh, then you can um, add in addition uh, a maximum uh, fundamental frequency. So this um, maximum fundamental frequency, um, it's uh, um, related to the uh, speed rotation, yeah, with a synchronous machine via the number of pole pairs. And when you know this maximum speed rotation, you know also the maximum uh, fundamental frequency. And uh, when you know the maximum fundamental frequency, you 
know the minimum cycle and then you can suppress every cycle which is smaller than that minimum cycle. At the same time you can use this uh, twice this maximum uh, fundamental frequency as a cutoff frequency um, for a Bessel filter yeah, um, to filter your cycle uh, source signal. Um, so that uh, this is more smooth and uh, less noisy and the cycle detection becomes easier um, because it is filtered, uh, it is a filtered signal. So Evelyn, you just spoke about filtering. Mm -hmm. Does it have any negative effects due to the phase shift? Um, the question is very good. Um, so um, you fear that you cannot calculate the efficiency or the power correctly because of phase shift between the voltage and the um, filtered current. Yeah, but we don't use the filtered current for our power and efficiency uh, calculations. Yeah. Um, we just use the filtered uh, current trace uh, to define the cycle. Um, to define the calculation period. Okay. And then I have one more question concerning the current. Mm -hmm. What to do if this current is like super small? Uh, then there's in addition the auto time mode and um, this is always working when uh, the cycle detection, the automated cycle detection fails, Yeah, then every second uh, calculation is done. So Evelyn, one more principal question. How do I set up my system if I don't have the possibility like Mitch had to get all the inverter currents? So maybe I have a case where I just get battery voltage or the motor output. How do I set it up then? Mm -hmm. When you have uh, just a possibility to measure at the motor output, you can uh, couple your um, calculation period uh, to one revolution, to one mechanical revolution yeah, uh, via the speed measuring system. And um, so you have the same dynamics uh, like in the drive cycle, yeah? And if you can uh, only use the signals from the battery, which is my, uh, maybe the DC signal, uh, then you have the possibility uh, to enter a fixed time period for calculation and this starts already with one millisecond. So to sum up and come back to the measurements again that we saw from Mitch. Where exactly can we see the true benefits of this cycle detection when we come to the measurement again? So when you did everything correctly, um, then you will have this cycle master signal and you see here exactly the time periods where the calculations are done. And so you can really see in detail and with the best possible resolution also um, where, for example, here reactive power is needed to um, yeah, start the scooter and uh, you see how this um, um, power uh, are becoming bigger uh, up to the maximum here. There was a jump and you can look here into the detail again and see that the current has become bigger uh, here. So at least, um, yeah, you have, uh, you see every detail uh, possible. And if I didn't set it up perfectly in the beginning of my measurement, is there any chance to do it like post-process? Um, yeah, so um, you have sort the raw data. So it's only uh, necessary that you have measured, that you have stored the raw data. When you have stored the raw data, you can uh, post with one click all the formulas into the post-process editor, and then you can recalculate everything using a different uh, cycle parameter setup. Evelyn, thank you very much for giving us more e detailed information about the cycle detection. You're welcome. <laughs> And if you want to learn more about our seminars, please visit our website. And in addition, you can write an email to academy at hpkvault.com. Goodbye. <laughs>